Now we move to our fifth program segment, which is called Art and Science. Um, almost everything that we've discussed at the conference, of course, involves science and technology, but we've had a quite liberal immersion in arts, too. What we're going to pursue in this first panel is a more specific application of science and technology to art, the way artistic careers are managed, artistic brands, an artist's relationship to his or her audience, and an artist's ability to expand the impact of his or her work in humanitarian ways and those beyond that his immediate professional purpose. And we have, uh, we have to discuss this, we have people who are exactly perfectly positioned to know about the, the combination of uh, art and science in this world. The chairman, or the, the leader or moderator of this panel is going to be Jim Wyatt, the chairman and CEO of the William Morris Agency, who knows as much about the business of art as anyone else who is alive. He's going to be joined by Chris DeWolf, the co-founder and CEO of MySpace, which of course has played a tremendous role in connecting artists to, to individuals. Wyclef Jean, who of course you, have, you know of and have heard, musician, producer, uh, an important social activist back recently from Haiti, and Forrest Whitaker, actor, director, producer, who swept the, uh, the board and all kinds of awards last year for his performance as Idi Amin, the last king of, of Scotland, coming after a long and distinguished career in other fields. So I could spend the rest of the time introducing the rest of the panelists. I'll just say, please join me in welcoming James Wyatt and his members of this panel. Thank you. It's intimidating sitting in front of the vice president here. <laughs> um, anyway, we, uh, the idea of talking about art and science, so I think what we've been discussing backstage may be veer a little bit away from there. And um, First of all, I wanted to, to say that last night with Wycliffe and Will I Am getting on stage was an extraordinary experience. For I'm sure everybody saw it. <laughs> And um, I thought we wanted to do first, only because uh, Wycliffe is back from Haiti, where we've experienced you know, something that's horrific on a global, global basis, and talk about maybe a little bit about just coming back from Haiti. And I think he wants to show a short film showing us uh, what's, what's unfortunately happening there. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just getting back from Haiti. I, uh, I'm no stranger to Haiti. I, was, uh, I left Haiti at the age of 10 years old. Uh, my first language, of course, is uh, Creole, which is the, the Haitian dialect uh, in French. Uh, my father was a, a minister of Nazarene faith. So uh, basically, we came to America because of political um, instability in Haiti. And uh, so being no stranger to Haiti, uh, a few weeks ago, we got hit by uh, four hurricanes back to back, back to back. So uh, I was doing an event with Matt Damon uh, called One by One in Toronto, and I saw what was going on with Ike. And I said, there's no way in the States that people are going to pay attention to four hurricanes back to back. So I, I told Matt Damon, I said, uh, you know what we should do? We should go to Haiti on Saturday and possibly create a blitz with the media to bring awareness because uh, people don't know what's going on. So we, we, we got on a plane uh, unannounced. Uh, we got to Haiti. Uh, we went to the capital, which is Port-au-Prince, because usually when people hear Haiti, uh, they don't have a clue. Uh, so the best way to explain it is Port-au-Prince is similar to Kingston, Jamaica. And so that's the capital. You go at your own risk to Kingston, Jamaica. And, uh, and, and we went to uh, 45 minutes outside of Port-au-Prince to a place which is called Cabaret. Cabaret is where the storm came in the middle of the night. Um, when we got there, it still was the same situation. The storm hit in the middle of the night. The houses were washed over to the mountains, creating mudslides. Mothers lost their kids. Their kids started floating in the water. Um, they piled bodies of the kids one by one, as they got them from the water. Um, I mean, it was, I mean, we all know what happened in Katrina, so you time that times uh, a million. Uh, amongst all of the madness, uh, 
some of the survivors uh, I spoke to was a man. He was 102 years old. And he had his wife next to him who was 105 years old. So I wanted to bring a little humor amongst so much sadness. And the guy was blind. He couldn't see. So I bend over to him and I said, man, what's the secret, man? How you live so long? What's the key to it? He says, everything that your wife says to you, just tell her she's right. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you'll live longer that way. That way. Um, I said, cool, I'll take that with me back home. <laughs> um, so what, what we engaged to do in, uh, in Kabare is a food distribution. And we started a distribution, not only giving people food, but we also had the food cooked for them where we also could give them. Um, then the next day, we proceeded to go to another place, which is called Gonaive, which is a whole nother city. So that's like saying we go into Montego Bay. We, we had problems with the UN helicopter because there's not enough helicopters going back and forth in Haiti for the aid at the time. Um, we get to go naive, overlooking at it from the air, it looks basically like a complete city underwater. The people that are still alive are basically living from their roofs. They have not eaten in a total of 12 days. So they're in a state of deranged where they're having illusions. They don't know if they should come back down from the roof. Um, we land, we get out of the chopper. The entire city smells like dead bodies, mucus. We have boots up this high, so I proceed. I'm like, I want to walk in the water, go amongst the families and see what's going on. Still inside of the water, the remains of body parts, the remains of dead cats, the remains of dead dogs, children walking around in this water with no shoes, nothing. Um, and I looked at Matt and, you know, tears came out of my eyes and I was just like, you know what? Human beings shouldn't be living like this. And the reality of it is it's forgotten. No one knows what's going on. Um, I proceeded to speak with the, the World Food Program and say, well, I know you have the food. What's the problem? The problem is that the people are so hungry that they cannot do these food distributions because the minute they set up the food distribution, the people serving the food gets attacked for the food. So what I said to the World Food Program was, let's set up a section so I could talk to these people in their languages. And uh, we went in front of a church, the masses gathered around, and the, 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 the World Food Program guy came, he said, Listen, man, this is what I need you to say. Tell them to calm down. Tell them we're gonna do the food distribution and they gotta just remain calm whenever we do it, don't attack us. I was like, well, the problem with that is if you put me in a room for 12 days, I haven't had any water, any food, I wouldn't be able to understand a word that you're saying. So there have to be a way to communicate this. So we brought the people out. They were inspired by our presence and our energy, which is the first thing. Because sometimes you got to give people hope. Hope is always the first thing. Hope goes a long way. With hope, a person has faith and say, guess what? People has not forgotten us. And that's really the first thing. Um, we talk to the people, and we, we are proceeding to we have a foundation which is called Yele Haiti. The foundation was basically started because I'm of Haitian descendant, and it was very important to, to get young Haitians to start to engage. The Haitian population, 70% of them is not even 21 yet. So you're dealing with a very young population that could basically change. So we, we started a hurricane relief fund, and uh, we bought some images Yep. Um, so sure. basically, y'all could see uh, what yes. was going on.
was going to say, um, it's, kind of, it's kind of difficult to talk about art and science right now, but um, um, I think the address for this will be provided for everybody, and if anybody and everybody wants to help, I know it would be, it would be much appreciated and great. And, uh, I'll, I'm going to try and somehow bring this panel back to what we we're supposed to be originally talking about. Well, I mean, when it comes to you know, oh, art and art art reflecting um, you know, what's going on in the world, you know, um, this, these images and stuff which have been projected are being put on the net, put on the news and things of that nature. I know for myself, I, I just actually finished a film that dealt with Hurricane Katrina down in New Orleans. I shot it recently. And um, it was uh, really about bringing hope to the city because it was a true story about a man who, who um, pulled back his, his, these, these teams and these, these teams together and made them believe in themselves again. But in the exploration of trying to understand um, this, what this devastation meant, and this one being much, much more, um, it was really difficult to comprehend because you would go into the town, into New Orleans, and you would be shooting images and stuff, and a lot of the streets were the same, so we didn't have to really change anything in the Ninth Ward. That there wasn't really a lot of repairs. It was still there. So we're, we're filming, just adding accents to something that really existed. And um, for myself, trying to understand as an actor, an artist, what they were going through, it was hard when I was walking through those streets to realize that when they were there, I would be underwater. So it's hard to, to, to picture that image of, of this water rushing by you, of trying to hold on to something, of basically trying to swim to the top of a roof. This, 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 uh, this is what I was, we're trying to, we were trying to reflect in, in, inside of a, a film emotional experience so that you don't ignore what's going on in places like this because this, this, this is about our connection as human beings and humanity and I think that art and the internet and technology is all reaching towards connecting us to understand that we have to be involved in these situations and understand the devastation that, that these people are, are going through all, all over the world. And in this case, Haiti. We ha I, 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 I think there was the one thing that was explored too and the research that goes on when you're working on a, on a movie was also to try to understand the emotional, the emotional pain that has been left behind. Because these people need immediate aid. They need to be able to eat water, to be able to have a place to stay and stuff. Hopefully, people will come to the aid of this, then you have to recognize that this is a trauma, a loss of things that emotionally the people are going to have to be dealing with maybe for the rest of their lives. And so we try to reflect that in the stories that we tell and we try to put that in, into the current uh, that connects all of us, which is part, partly the internet and, and our hearts, I think, more than anything, our hearts. And um, kind of an interesting transition Chris, between you and Wycliffe, about what your what MySpace is is doing with with uh, and helping in this effort. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're talking about getting the word out, and there's a lot of different ways to get the word out. And you know, it used to be exclusively, obviously, through television and and print, and um, that's not quite as effective anymore. Um, you know, people are using the internet; that's where they spend most of their day socializing on sites like MySpace, and so because of that, you know, artists come to us and, you know, we help promote whatever it is that they want to promote or um, allow them to put their art on, on MySpace and allow people that wouldn't be able normally discover it to be able to discover it. Um, it also provides them a, a platform for creative freedom. Um, but in addition to these uh, more commercial projects, you know, we're also very focused on civic projects as well. You know, anything going back to Hurricane Katrina. Um, we're committing right now to help, you know, Wycliffe with his latest project. Uh, um, you thank know, you. Putting everything on the home page to solicit donations. <laughs> to 120 million people worldwide. And we just think the power of the masses is, is really important. And, you know, that's how, that's how they're getting their news these days. Um, we're also very involved in the presidential elections. Um, again, an unprecedented, an unprecedented number of young people are registering this year. It's always been a promise for the last, you know, 30 years, 40 years. It, that really hasn't um, come to be until this year. And um, I think the whole community and, and being able to interact with um, different causes or, 
you know, people like Wycliffe and being able to really understand it and create that connection um, is what, you know, gets people to really feel uh, the emotion as, as Forrest was talking about earlier. And um, I was somebody, what I was supposed to do is also talk about what we do as a company, but I think the best statement I can say is, I'm, I'm the lucky one in my company that gets to work with these guys in, in a professional and personal way. So I'm, I'm very lucky that's what my company does. But, um, in terms of just, I was going to ask a couple of business questions if I could. Forrest, you, you've been an Academy Award winning actor, very successful filmmaker, producer, and you're also very interested in the convergence of technology and art. And I know you recently have a deal with Pepsi. And I was curious as to what drove you toward that and what you plan to do with that relationship. Uh, would what that was about when I when I was working on uh, that project, they were trying to find a way to to take a game and get the participants who played the game to go um, create a drink that would be the new drink that would represent themselves, and so uh, try to create a myth because I, I, what I what I said to them was that you would want that the, that the drink would represent them, that would represent their souls or something that they were reaching towards, and so created a um, a short film that would be the myth. And the myth was about, basically about democracy. And it was about the ability to be able to express yourself and have a voice and be able to be strong. And so we shot this short film. The short film will be put on the net and was shown in theaters and stuff as the sort of catalyst to be able to move into the next part. Because in this environment, this character, was, his job was to take, take away creativity and expression. And ultimately, there was a grail that would be found and this grail would be like the spirit of man. So we shot this. And, then he would dive off into the world, to the, to the abyss, because when he, he was being chased because of this grail, he jumped off the side of the city into these waters. And when he got out of the waters, then the participant would be able to play inside of the game. They would come up into the game. And the game was based on a seven-tier system, a chakra system, starting in red all the way to white. And the bottoms would, they would like explore power in red and they would explore emotions. It was to, to help teach them, but at the same time, as they were playing these games, they were discovering things about themselves. They were discovering um, uh, how they felt about vanity, how they felt about different things, and they would be categorized into different areas. And they, these th three tiers, and they would create three drinks that would represent them. And they would continue to create the taste and the, all these different things based on sort of, sort of um, ancient mystical systems of like Vedic systems, uh, Taoist systems. Uh, and, and so they would be put into these categories and have these three drinks. And these three drinks, they themselves would go virally on the net and try to, try to get people to vote for them, you know, because this was an expression of themselves. And um, ultimately, it would rise and rise and rise until they got to the last drink, which was, because it was about breaking the wall. It was about breaking the fourth wall, this kind of concept. The fourth wall was, because uh, inside the, the short film, there would be things that you would see, you know, um, where Baron would say that, you know, the, they say the polar ice caps are melting, but they're not, you know. It's something we're dealing with in the political scene right now. It's, it's the way people view certain things, you know. And um, we would take this and we put it virally into YouTube or into different things on an extended version. And so we were commenting like that. But ultimately, they were going to go out into the world and they were going to see the posters in the world that they saw in the video. And then they were going to have a drink that would cross past the sort of fourth wall because they would walk into the store and they'd see something that they created and they would have empowered it with their own thoughts and their own feelings. And then there, they would actually take it in a Eucharistic way, and uh, it would become a part of them. So it passed the sort of fourth wall. So it was, it was a game that was like multidimensional that would move on all these different levels and stuff and layers to go out into the world. Okay. I was going to ask a question that maybe will probably dovetail into hmm. Wycliffe and to Chris here, but I've just anecdotally, um, Chris, who's a graduate of USC, there's Paul Brico, who works with me, is in the audience, I'm right over there, um, who, he was actually in Paul's class at USC, and he wrote his paper, and I guess it was 96 or 1996 or 97, it was called Zeitgeist, <laughs> which was uh, in the beginning of MySpace, way back when. And the uh, question I was gonna ask both of you is, in the last 10 years, we have watched a robust music business that we knew from record labels and the power of, of power of music through record labels and how it has changed and where it seems to be going in the future. And as almost, I'm sure everybody in this room knows that the record companies are going through a, 
an evolution, which is probably not a good one. Um, and I was curious as to where you see this going, and Chris is about in the next month to launch MySpace Music, and w how the intersection of this works between the artist and producer and on the one hand and distributor on the other. Well, the good thing about this is no matter where the record company goes, a great artist is a great artist. And that's really the first thing. Um, the second thing is that uh, the consumer can just get it in two seconds now. Um, it's sort of like, uh, I want pizza, give it to me right now. And, and the record company can't produce pizza that quick. Um, you know, it got to get the pepperoni on it, the cheese <laughs> on it. And by the time, the, I don't want no pizza no more, I'm out of this store. <laughs> so what happens is, I, the best way to, to ex, I guess people like pizza in here. The, 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 the best way to explain this is I have a song called If I Was President. Um, and this was a song I did a couple of years ago. Great song. And thank you, son. And this song absolutely got no radio airplay. They wouldn't play it on the radio. But if you go up on MySpace, it's like the number one Wyclef Jean song ever of all times. And that's because where the music is going now is it's in the hands of the fans. Um, they barely listen to the radio. They're on the net 24-7. So I feel that the, where the music is going to, it's, it, the best way to explain it is similar to the Fugees. Um, the Fugees, the group that I come from, is the biggest hip-hop selling group of all time, 22 million copies. Now this CD, which we bought to Sony Music, was done in my uncle's basement, in our uncle's basement, um, with three or four pieces of equipment. You know, us studying the equipment, studying wave files, and, uh, and then by the time we bought the CD to Sony, Sony was like, man, where did y'all record this? Hit Factory, it's great. I was like, no, we recorded it in the basement. Um, if, any know, if anyone here in here knows about studios, about automation, at the time we had no automation. So what I would do is, me and my cousin Jerry, I would time, okay, I'd say one, one minute and 30 seconds, the bass comes out, and so we did it manually, which means that the power of technology has always been in the kids, uh, in the hands of the kids. Um, so I feel that that's where it's moving at towards the future, just in the hands of the young generation. Chris, I, yeah. I think one of the big things that's happened, you know, in the last ten years, five years, is that you know before it was only really large artists. I mean, you're talking about making it, being able to being able to easily find the pizza. Mm -hmm. It's easier to find if, if um, you know, you're really well known. Um, I think what the internet's done in the last 10 years is um, it's made it possible for those emerging artists to actually earn a living. Um, you know, the internet gives them a platform. They've always had the platform of, you know, buying really um, cheap software, Pro Tools, a cheap PC to make a pretty high quality CD similar to what you're talking about. Um, but there was no real promotional mechanism. And what the internet offered was a promotional mechanism that, you know, the big music companies in the past um, offered, you know, through radio promotion and, and other marketing. Um, now they can use sites like MySpace to do that. Um, but on the other hand, so what we're trying to do is create a whole economy for, for all musicians. So if you go onto an artist page, um, you know, you develop all this huge fan base, people discover your music that they wouldn't be able to discover before. You create a really intimate relationship with your fans, and then you go on the road, you send them a message, and you say, come to my show. You fill up your venue, and you make your money off of selling merchandise, tickets, um, you know, mugs, r ringtones, whatever it may be. Um, but we also firmly believe that, that there's been this sort of weird tension between the technology community, you know, which is obviously a lot of people in this room, um, and, um, and the music community. And they've sort of been butting heads. And you know, we feel that that's been really unhealthy because we believe that you know, there's a huge, huge role for the big music companies um, moving forward. So we, what we've done is we've formed a joint venture with all the major music companies to offer their full catalog, like virtually any song that's ever been recorded online um, for free streaming. Um, so that's what's happening illegally. So what we're doing is we're making that, um, you know, legal, and we're making sure that we're bringing sponsors and, you know, making people like Toyota or uh, McDonald's or State Farm Insurance, 
you know, actually pay for that and have that money trickle down um, to the artist. So um, instead of people stealing the music, they can listen to it for free on MySpace and discover it in a similar way that they do in the offline world. So the analog would be your friend telling you, uh, you know, three CDs that they bought last month or, you know, 10 downloads that they got from iTunes. I'm going to create my playlist from that or I may go to Wycliffe's page and, um, you know, I may love his taste in music and I can just grab his p playlist and put it on mine. And in addition to that, we'll also be creating a lot of original content. So the idea is to kind of go along with the behavior of um, how people are consuming uh, content, how they're using the internet, and providing a business model behind that that works for the big music companies, the independent music companies, and um, of course, MySpace. Okay. Do we have questions? Anybody I want to ask questions from the audience? No? Go ahead. This is a question for both Forrest and uh, Chris on the issue of uh, embedded in both the Pepsi thing and what you just described in terms of who's going to pay for the the, uh, the music venture is is a, is a sponsor or, or sponsors, and you know I, I uh, I've, I've run Sundance until we sold it to Rainbow and a lot of our programming was paid for by sponsors Iconoclast underwritten by Grey Goose, but every time you have one of those kinds of relationships you are in effect taking on a uh, it's not like, hey, just give me your money and I'm not going to really... I'm, I'm curious how Pepsi reacts when you explain an idea like that. Do they start to... In many cases, I would imagine it's either Pepsi giving notes or, in, in your case, Toyota saying, well, we, we want to be part of this, but you're not going to associate us with certain bands or lyrics. And I, it, it just... Um, it's a, I think it's the right path. It's the first thing I think you do, you do these days, go find a like-minded brand. But I'm curious what it's really like when you're finally in a room. It, is, is it uh, present new complications? You know, from, from my perspective, um, you know, everything's all baked before, you know, we sign any deal. So we're fortunate that we have, a, there's a lot of barriers to entry to doing what we're doing. You know, we have 300 people in our sales and sales creative groups. We have 250 people in our sales technology groups. So a lot of thought goes into this. You have creative people on both sides. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we um, did the JV joint venture with all the music companies. So we would have their cooperation and thus the artist cooperation and you know, marry that up with the brand attributes um, of the advertiser. So thus far, we haven't had any problems. I think, uh, I mean, with, with um, first I met with um, Matty Lesham and Frank Cooper over at, uh, at Pepsi, this is for uh, Mountain Dew. And um, really, they were trying and searching for something that was new. And when they brought me in to deal with it, they, they sort of, they allowed me to, to uh, start creating. There was a number of people working on the project. There was the advertisement uh, areas, and, and then we had to bring in like illusion arts and different types of technical people to create the games and stuff like that. But they were, uh, pretty free with the way I shot. In fact, in the, in the short film, it doesn't say Pepsi in it. You don't see a Pepsi anywhere. You, you know, it's not, no reference to it. It's called democracy, though, not democracy. It's called democracy, as in Mountain Dew. So that was the one thing I wanted to call it liquid, liquid <laughs> mountain, and they want to, you know, so it was called democracy, which is what it was about. Um, but the process was, um, was, was, was enjoyable. Until we got down to cutting the trailers and stuff like that, which I have to say that they did offer for me to cut, you know what I mean? But I, I, it was just a long process. Um, and then the way they went into the next part of the advertisement. I wasn't involved at the very end when we were seeing the posters up on the streets with the three drinks and stuff and democracy. Uh, I just had given my projection of the way I thought it should go. So it was actually a, a good experience. And, and uh, they, they had asked for me to do more of the same because it was a, for them it was the, the biggest launch of a new soft drink that they had ever had in their history. So uh, of a new beverage in the Mountain Dew's history, so they were excited. So. Um, there were some questions here, but unfortunately, we um, are running out of time. We do, on behalf of all of us, we do want to thank everybody here from Google and for Eric Schmidt sitting over there for hospitality and thanking him very much for bringing us down here and taking us home. So anyway, thank you very much. I wish we had more time. Thank you.